Hello, my name is Ken Kinter. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is group facilitation, and this is part two, game on. Uh, it's highly recommended that you watch part one before you catch this part. It sort of builds on the one before it. And as always, my contact information is on the bottom of this slide. Before we get started, I uh, just wanted to give some credit to where credit is due to the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, the project that I work for, the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative, uh, is a joint effort between the New Jersey Department of Health and Rutgers University to help improve the quality of care and to improve working conditions in New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals. Uh, we've been there for about 15 years now. Um, this mission would not be possible without their generous financial and other forms of support, and that helps make this possible as well, so we thank them for that. So what we're gonna be covering, again, this is part two in the series, and there will be at least uh, one more video in the series. Picking up some of the stuff that we didn't catch in video number one, we're going to talk about group dynamics. Uh, we're going to pay specific attention to the different stages of groups and the tasks that are specific to each stage. We're going to talk about focus, the skills of cutting off and drawing out, which are also very important. Uh, we're going to follow up on the first video talking about the use of rounds, dyads, triads, and exercises. We'll discuss uh, challenges and also give you a long list of stuff, tools that you can use to help you navigate group. And the last part will be about timing, uh, which to me is one of the most difficult parts about a group, especially starting out. So group dynamics. So in the previous uh, presentation, we talked about content. And content is the material that you actually bring to a group, the resources, the physical materials. The dynamics is all of the interplay and interaction between the people in the group. And it can be everything from um, who sits with who, who talks to who, the group dynamic that forms, a hierarchy that tends to, uh, to form between people, who teams up against who, who are the more dominant people in the group. So this is interesting stuff to pay attention to. And as we talked about before, one of the nice parts about co-facilitation is one person can pay attention to this while the other person pays attention to the content, but that isn't always possible. But it's critical that you in running your group observe this because one of the central tenets of group is that each person in the group has equal value. So your job to a certain degree is to fight this hierarchy and make sure that everyone has uh, equal say in the group, which is a challenge. So regarding stages of group, uh, there are a couple different theories about how this works. Uh, the Jacobs textbook, uh, which I use in the class, uh, describes it as beginning, working, and closing. Uh, Corey describes it as initial transition working and final. So you have that transition stage uh, between the initial and the working uh, specified. And then one of the classic ones is from Tuckman, the forming, norming, storming, and performing. Uh, I think it's, it's great that they worked that out that it rhymes, but it also covers the major tasks of those. The group forms, the group forms some sort of norms and regulation. There's a part where they feel safe uh, in conflict with each other, which doesn't happen in the beginning when everybody's pretending to be nice. Some people may view conflict between group members as a bad sign for group. In a way, it's actually a sign that the group's doing its work. And then the performing part where they actually get to work. Tuckman doesn't have something that identifies that final closing stage, which um, might be a shortcoming in that one. But without that foundational work, I don't think some of these other ones uh, occur. So we're going to go from the you know, the beginning um, working and final uh, uh, stage. So in the beginning stage, this is the beginning of things. So everybody introduces themselves. There's this thing called setting the container. And, and to me, that's just a, a metaphor for creating a safe space for the group to happen in. And that is that you don't let people holler at other people. You make sure that everybody has value, treat everybody with respect. You put the expectations out about how the group is gonna be and be consistent. Uh, that's what makes the container. State clearly stating the goals of the group, forming or communicating what the group rules are going to be. And again, some of your group rules might be laid down by where you work, and then some other group rules you might be able to set in groups specifically. Not all groups necessarily abide by the same rules. Uh, for example, I ran an anger management group, and we had a discussion about the use of profanity, and we said that it was okay to use profanity uh, how, as long as it wasn't directed at someone that was in the group. 
Uh, that might not be a good rule for other types of groups, but we had it, it was pretty important. So in the beginning stage is a feeling out process for the members. A lot of projection going on, everybody looking at each other, thinking what they think about each other person and making assumptions about them. Um, this can be one group or several groups. If the group is open, which means there's new members coming in all the time, the group will re regress back toward the stage uh, once it leaves it when new people come in the door. Uh, there's always a reintroductory period uh, where people are deciding if it's safe and how new people come in. Uh, think about new kids coming to class in school and how that impacts the class. So next up, the working stage. And this is when we shift from all that beginning introduction, nice stuff, and we start to get into the work of the group. Now, part of the work of the group is the actual stated purpose of the group. The other part of it is that members will begin to clash with each other because they're, what, what was that old saying on MTV's Real Worlds? When people stop being nice and start being real, this is when they get real. The nice part's over. Uh, the other nice part about the working stage is that people will begin to get benefits. They'll actually start making progress forward. The introductory stage is so hard because they haven't gotten any benefits yet, and it's, the group may feel like it's more aggravation to the members than it's worth. Here they start to get some benefit out of the group, and there's some group cohesion as well. Ending stage is a wrap-up. Uh, sharing what's been learned. Uh, we'll talk about the specifics of this and, and the tasks that are about that. Uh, but it's not just so easy as, okay, group's over. Uh, there's some emotional attachment to the group and some processes that need to be done there as well. It's usually one group session, which should be announced in advance. However, it can be more if the, the group is running longer. All right, so the beginning stage. The first and second sessions are the hardest and the first few minutes are key. Your goal of your first session is to make sure there's a second session. You wanna create an, a welcoming environment instead of a go awaying environment. Um, you're gonna introduce people to each other. It's good to bring the positive energy and bring the enthusiasm. You know, you're happy to be there and you have a purpose to being there and you're encouraging other people to be the same way. You're gonna explain what the group's purpose is and your own role, uh, how the group is gonna work, uh, and you're also getting an idea of where everybody is. Who are the people that you're going to have to cut off? Who are the people that you're going to draw out? Who are the people that may be conflictual or test boundaries? So every, this is like a feeling out process uh, at the very beginning. It may be more about that process than about any of the actual content of the group at this point. You're still creating that container of the group and it's not ready to do work yet. So lots of other aspects to be done in the beginning. Uh, how comfortable is everybody? You just want to make it a clear, safe place um, for, for everyone as much as possible. Second session. You may have new members coming in the second session. And it's really nice if you can have a group member introduce them instead of you doing all the work. Hopefully by the second, um, by the second group, you can start asking the group members, well, what did we say about that last time? What are the group rules? What are the group expectations? Oh, do we have someone new? Can someone uh, introduce that new person? Each group, you want to talk about what the purpose is so that everyone knows why they're in the room. If you have a board, write it on the board so that you have it written down so that people can see it and reference it. You may also need to do some course correction. If there were some problems or something unresolved from the first group, this is a good time to clean it up before you get into the work of the group so that you, uh, it doesn't get in the way of the content. For example, in one of, uh, I ran an anger management group in a jail and we had one participant who was covered in swastikas and uh, Ku Klux Klan tattoos. And he was sitting between two African-American gentlemen. Uh, we had to clean that up in the first two sessions before we could move forward and do work. And, and actually it ended up working out a whole lot better than I expected it to. So the focus begins with the leader. If the leader is not focused, the group will not be focused. The group will go on its own way, probably sabotage it. The way I think about the focus is if the group were being televised, and if you look up the Corey textbook in the back, he has a video um, called Groups in Action, which is a fantastic videotaped uh, process group. It gives you a very clear illustration of what focus is. So if you were televising the group, who would the camera be on? So it would usually be on the person speaking, but then there would be cutaways to other people that were listening. And then you would get an idea of how it was going um, by who was talking and who was on camera. 
So as the leader, you want to bring the focus to the group, but then have the group take it over. Uh, however, the leader dictates how deep the focus goes. How long do we stay on one person? When has the camera been on one person too long and it's time to move it to someone else? And that's a, that's a, a, a group issue there. If you're a good facilitator, you're focusing on someone, but you're also watching everybody else out of the corner of your eye to see when you're losing the group. Are they into it? Are they following it? Or are they checking out of it? And then it's time to move that focus around. Also, depending on what kind of group you're doing, you might not want to go that deep. Uh, in, in our hospital, these aren't therapy groups, so we don't want to go too far deep into one person. We would rather spend some time with everybody that really bear down on one person. We have other groups that may be different, for example, trauma groups and things like that. So these are ways of being able to work with um, you know, the focus of the group. Um, you have a lot of different stuff you can do. You can do contracts. There's a lot more content on this in the textbook, which I'll talk about at the end. But you have all these different techniques at your availability. So it isn't just you talking to them or them talking to you or to each other. You have all sorts of things that you can do uh, to work with that. Now up next is the skill that my boss actually feels is the most important group skill and I'm not gonna argue with him about it. Uh, we have cutting off and drawing out. Cutting off is simply when someone's over participating and again, losing the room, how do you redirect? But how do you redirect without making it personal? Um, and then drawing out is the exact opposite. You have some people that will not share at all. How can you get them uh, to participate? So your goal is, and, and we have some indicators in the, um, the toolkit at the end of this uh, presentation has a lot of suggestions about this in specific detail. But basically the short version of the story is you wanna start out with as minimal as possible, starting with your eye contact. If you're trying to speak to someone, you look at them. If you, the first thing you do when you're trying to cut somebody off is to turn your eye contact away. So you wanna take it up one step at a time until that person gets it so that you can restore balanced, um, balanced participation. So don't say it, show it. So three very valuable tools, which we talked about in the first video, rounds, dyads and triads and exercises. And we will talk more about exercises uh, specifically in this video as well. The rounds, as we mentioned, a quick whip around round uh, to have each person in the group share something very quick even if it's how angry they are on a scale of one to 10, describe how they feel in, a, in one word or in a weather report. And the two rules of the rounds are people can pass if they want to and get everybody, get them quickly. Dyads and triads, breaking the group into twos or threes uh, so that they can do work together. You can give them assignment that they can work on in teams. Uh, these, the advantages of dyads and triads also is it gives you time to think if a group is getting a little weird uh, you can do one of these uh, interventions to buy yourself some time. While they're following up the assignment, you have time to refocus yourself, which does happen. We all get carried away uh, in the process of group and get away from the, the purpose sometimes. And then exercises we'll talk about in, in much more detail in, in this video. And you have a wide range of these. We're not going to do it justice. There could be a whole video about exercises as well, and maybe there will be. So part of your goal is to build comfort and trust in the group. So this is an example of something you would do in a quick round. I'm going to go around the room. Just briefly share what you like to do on the weekends. Quick answer, each person. And then if you retain that, then that's something you can draw from uh, later on. You want to get members involved. Tell us about the best and worst thing that happened to you this week. It's almost like in any group gathering, there's this little ritual that happens that, that happens before the actual thing happens. Think about a baseball game, all the rituals that happen before the first pitch gets thrown or you go to church and there's all these things that happen before the service happens. It's to get people into that. Some people have called it sacred space, but it's that it's forming the container in time uh, for this, uh, for the group. Uh, another example of this, the weather forecast, the scale of one to 10, as we mentioned uh, before. Neat idea to do these rounds at the beginning and end of group. If you're doing anger management, scale of one to 10, how angry are you right now? Do it at the beginning, check in again at the end. Guaranteed you're gonna have somebody that's more than a 10 and, that's, and you wanna know that at earliest opportunity. Uh, again, you wanna shift it so we involve all people. So there's an example here. So if you have someone who's going on a tear and this will happen to you, this is one of the most common 
uh, group facilitator challenges. So you see someone saying, and another thing, I don't get any help from my family at all. Facilitator cuts in. I'm curious where everyone else is on this. Let's do a quick round where everybody dot, dot, dot. So again, you haven't cut that person off. You haven't told them to shut up or you haven't told them they're talking too much. But at the same time, you've moved the focus back into the room again so that you don't lose the rest of the group and so that you can get back to what you were actually there to do uh, in the first place. Drawing out people. Again, we'll talk about some ways to do this in the toolkit at the end. Uh, one trick is to end around on that person, which gives them more time. Uh, in extreme examples, we've actually given people time where we actually specifically check in. We had one gentleman who I'm going to call Alex, and Alex never spoke unless spoken to. So we would dedicate a few minutes at the end of each group. And we were like, okay, everybody stop. Everybody stop. We just want to hear what Alex has to say. And sometimes he would say something. Actually, strangely enough, most of what he said was really on point. So it was very helpful. Uh, I've also used a strategy where I've said, okay, some of you are very kind and you don't jump right into the conversation, but I do want to hear from everybody during the course of the day. So here's your opportunity if you haven't spoken yet. Um, and again, each person, you want them each to get, you want each person to get input into what's going on. They know, again, the group having the value of each person in it. And plus, you never know where the learning is going to come from. More often, I find the clients learn more from their peers in the group than from me, the facilitator which is annoying because I'm sitting here doing all this work and I went to school for a long time, but they tend to get more of the information from each other and that's okay. So processing exercises, which we'll talk about later on in this video as well, uh, essential, essential to, to process an exercise. Processing the exercise is at least as important as the exercise itself so that people can have time to think about what the experience was and what they learned from it and how it made them think differently. Uh, and then summarizing a group, the last part of a group, uh, and I, I believe we'll touch on this later, but I like summarizing a group and closing it out with, so what did you learn that you didn't know when you came in here? Um, you know, is there some way you can learn what we talked about today in your life outside of this room? Or what's something you'd like to do before next time, you know, and use that as a launching pad for, uh, for homework. Middle stage, most important stage. Uh, somewhat easier, a little bit easier than the beginning stage, but very important. Uh, I always tell group facilitators, critical to have a plan A and a plan B, because plan A frequently doesn't make it. Uh, so you have what you think it's going to be, and we've talked about uh, curriculum and lesson plans and all that, and we'll talk about that a little more, but always have a backup, even if it's more of just a fun backup or something else, just so you have some place to go if it doesn't work, so you're not you're not, you don't get stuck. Um, middle stage, people are comfortable with each other now. You can ask them, what do they like about the group? What do they don't like about the group? What would they like to see the group doing more of? Uh, you can tell how that group is going by attendance, participation, whether people are doing homework, whether people are on time, whether they stay all the way through. Um, that's a really good gauge of how engaged people are uh, in the group. And it's worth it to bring it up. If there's something wrong in the room, bring it up. Uh, so that you can address it in real time. And you're modeling what you're talking about. If you have a problem, bring it to the group so people can discuss it. Uh, other issues about group, people's trust level in the group. Balancing content and process, which is difficult. My guess is if you're working in a mental health facility or a hospital, it's good to have a lot of content and operate off of that and not to get too deep into the process. If you have people where you work that are licensed, that are therapists or licensed social workers or whatever, move the process stuff onto them. You and your role may have a specific type of content that you're bringing to that group and, and you should roll with that. Uh, knowing when a person isn't working out in the group, uh, you have to consult with your colleagues and your supervisor about whether something's working or not because you may just have somebody who's slow to engage in the group or you may have someone that they're impeding the pro progress of other people in the group and you don't want that. Confidentiality is a sticky issue in group because you can't guarantee it. All you can do is encourage people to not share what they've heard in the group, uh, but there's no way to guarantee it. People very often bring it out. And of course, you need to um, respect that confidentiality yourself. Something you've heard in that group doesn't come outside of that group. And of course, the challenge is dealing with uh, drift. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted and to move into other areas. Some clients maybe don't want to do their work, so they're very happy distracting and making small talk for an entire group. Or maybe they've been in groups before where the entire group is small talk. 
you know, I used to refer to these as how you doing groups. Everybody basically goes, how you doing? Well, how you doing? How you doing? 45 minutes goes by and they're done. But no group work's been done. It's just informal socializing. That's okay for the first five minutes, then it's time to, time to move on. So common mistakes that are made. Um, Overleading the group. You know, it shouldn't be like a teacher in grade school in a class with everybody facing them. Um, the warm up is too long. We take too long to get down to business. That's an avoidance thing. Uh, we lose the focus somewhere along the way. Staying on one member too long, which is kind of like therapy with an audience, we try to avoid that. If you don't come in with a plan B and plan A doesn't work, and then you're stuck and the group effectively ceases to move forward anywhere. Not leaving enough time to process, particularly processing exercises, and just a group that's boring. Uh, if you don't make it exciting, if you don't bring energy into it, I don't know. How, you can't expect anybody else to be energetic at all, and then everybody will look like uh, you know Mr. Kitty there in the corner. So closing a session. Now, some of you may work in open groups where people are coming and going all the time, so you might not have a closing session, or you may take the last two minutes of a group to make it a quick close at that point where you can say, you know, I've, I've enjoyed having you in group. I wish you all the best. You know, if I don't see you again from here, you might do something as quick as that. If you have a closed group that has the same membership from beginning to end, you need to put, book a, that last session. You don't really want to do new work in that session. You want to just use that to close. Um, I like to announce during the series of a group, if I know when the end is, uh, I announce it repeatedly in my course. We do a 15 session uh, class and I will announce the closing session probably five times in the, in, during those 15 sessions. I want people to be aware. In the beginning, I tell them it's gonna go fast and it's gonna be over before they know it. I tell them when we get to the midterm, you're halfway there and then uh, give reminders as we get down to the last few sessions so people can emotionally uh, prepare for it. So purpose, uh, you wanna summarize and highlight the main points of what, did, what you learned. Um, what would you do for next time if you were doing, going to do this over again? Uh, and, and checking for unfinished business, but not starting unfinished business. Uh, there's something we call doorknob therapy. Doorknob therapy is the session's over, people are just leaving, and just when they get to the door, they go, oh yeah, and by the way, and then they start this huge piece of work. Uh, that will happen to you. My favorite answer to that, and you feel free to steal this, is we don't have nearly enough time to do this justice here and then give a suggestion of where they can do it. If they come to group again, or is there someone specific they can go to? But to me, I wanna do this in a respectful way, like not like, oh, we don't have time for this. We can't give this the attention that it deserves right here, right now. And then where can we? Because you do wanna keep that going. Sometimes that's a form of sabotage. They come into a group promising that they're gonna do some work, and then all of a sudden they realize when they're walking out the door that they haven't kept that promise, and they just wanna do 30 seconds on it so they can say they tried, or blame you for not having had it done. So uh, sorry to go on a little rant about that, but that's gonna happen to you. Um, so just that statement about, we don't really have time to do that justice. Where can we, where can you bring that? I like the idea that you're bringing that up. Let's go with that. Where can we bring it? All right, so on some of the formats for being able to close up, you can close with a round, as we mentioned before. We can do dyads, uh, you can do summaries, written reactions, but the key is to wrap it up uh, the key is to wrap up the group. You want it to have a clean close so that somebody can move on to whatever the next one is. And again, let's remember a lot of people that we're working with may have abandonment issues. They may have some trauma around this. That you, there may be a group that someone hasn't participated in at all or doesn't seem to care about. But when they're getting ready to leave, they can become very emotional about it. And it's not about the group. It's about unresolved past abandonment or, or you know, stuff that they've had to deal with before. And now here it is. So some of the techniques are being clear about the purpose, cutting off, drawing out, as we've mentioned before. Uh, these are some of the things that you would do to be able to you know, close the group in a good way. And again, the other thing you wanna do is what's the next step? I wanna encourage people when they're leaving a group, what's the next move for you? Okay, you've come however far you've come, and a big part of that closing group is, how are you different? You know, just like in each session, you say, well, what have you learned that you didn't know when you first walked in here today? When you're in that last session, you want to ask, how are you different than the person that walked in here? What do you know that you didn't know when you came in? And how can we continue this going forward? How can this be an ongoing part of your 
progress uh, going forward. And again, you have lots of different exercises that you can do. Uh, the reunion fantasy is if we were all to meet again, how would you want that uh, to go? I encourage people to write about their experiences, to journal about their experiences, uh, so that again, they can take this learning forward and remember uh, what they've done. Uh, one other idea about closing is you want to end it in a positive way. You want to end it as a celebration. You want to be happy at the end. Uh, you know, this was really great. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, and I'm curious what you guys learned as well. And that you assist them in, in, a, in a joyous transition into wherever they're going instead of this is just another thing in my life uh, that's ending. So let's talk about, these are some of the some problem situations uh, that you will come across. Um, you will have the monopolist, the person that over participates in group. You know you're gonna hear from them early and often. And this is where you're gonna be practicing your cutting off skills. How do you reduce this person's participation without hurting their feelings or personalizing it and get it around to everybody else? The dominator will challenge you, uh, challenge your authority. Uh, they know more than you do, and everybody should listen to them. So we have these little wannabe power struggles in the group. And so how do you, you know, keep yourself in your position of, hey, this is my job. This is what I'm here to do. I appreciate your help and enlist their help, but not to have them take over the group. Again, you're fighting the hierarchy. The distractor, the person that doesn't want to talk about anything that you want to talk about in the group and just wants to take the group in any type direction. The rescuer. The person who keeps saying, well, it's okay, you're gonna be fine, it's gonna get better, don't cry. It's okay to cry in group. It's okay to be upset in group. It's okay to be angry or sad or whatever you're feeling uh, in group at the time. Don't try to save people from their feelings and don't allow people in group to save other people from their feelings. They're just trying not to save their own. Mr. or Mrs. Uh, Ms. Negativity, where just everything sucks and everything's awful and you know, you're trying to provide some enthusiasm and instill hope and this person isn't having any of that. So how do you counter that without getting pulled in? Uh, the resistor, anything you wanna do, they don't wanna do. Uh, it's just, uh, they're, they're just in opposition to you. And then the saboteur is someone who will seemingly go along with what you wanna do, but then they're gonna try to blow it up in the middle. So you're gonna come across all of these things. And again, the toolkit at the end talks about a, diff a bunch of different strategies. One of my favorite strategies is just if you have material and content, just to bring it back to that. You know, I came in today, I had this material I wanted to share with you guys, and I wanna make sure we get through it in the limited amount of time that we have and just reroute it back to the material. Other problems we talked about, silence, the group of the living dead. Um, some people hate the groups that are really loud and scattered and all over the place. Some people are um, un un unhappy with these groups that are much quieter. Those are the ones that I struggle with. How do you get people moving? How do you get people encouraged in group? And again, by bringing the energy or by doing exercises or rounds or diets, you make it more exciting, more fun for them to participate. Dealing with sexual feelings, you may have people who say se sexually explicit stuff in group, and it may or may not be appropriate in that group. Hopefully that's addressed in your group rules. Dealing with crying, we talked about already. I'm fine with people crying in group. Uh, if someone feels like they need to leave and get themselves together, that's fine. But I don't make them leave group if they're crying. I'd rather them be in group and upset. Uh, and if that triggers other people, then that's okay. You know, dealing with a mutually hostile situation. Occasionally, you get people that may square off with each other. We be with each other, and the trick is you don't want to take sides with one over another and eject one person from the group and not the other, unless that one person has clearly violated group rules and the other person hasn't. In the, in the best of worlds, they both go if things get to a point where there's some dangerousness. Because again, your primary responsibility as the group facilitator is the safety and well being of the entire group, not any one member. You may have to ask a member to leave. If they're not together for whatever reason, you could say to have them take five, take a walk, get a drink of water, come on back. Uh, if things get really drastic, you may have to ask a person to leave group altogether, but that would require some one on one outside of group. I wouldn't want to handle that specifically in a group setting. And you're very often you're working with people who have challenges in their social skills. If you watch the third video in the series about doing groups with um, people with severe and persistent mental illness, we go into that in, in significant detail. So what we have here is a toolkit of a whole bunch of things. I used to call these group weapons, but I didn't like the idea that it sounded violent. So starting from the top left here and going down and then down this right column. 
This to me is a progressive list of all of your interventions for dealing with disruptive behavior. So the first one we have is modeling, where you model appropriate behavior. And an important group question is, how much ignoring do you do? How much of a behavior do you ignore before you respond to it? Or do you tolerate it because that's that person? You know, if the person doesn't mean to do something, but they do it, you just sort of weather the storm. You may have a client that has Tourette's, for example, so they vocalize a lot, and that might be an interruption in the group, but the group may learn to, to, to deal with it. And then as you go down this list, you want to have as many of these things in your arsenal as possible, because what ends up happening is when someone's a problem in group, very many group facilitators don't have a lot of tools. So they'll basically ignore, tell them to stop it, tell them louder to stop it, and then throw them out of group. And as we can see here, there's a whole list of things. You can have people read. Uh, you can redirect back to the subject or back to another person. Um, you can do some one-to-one -one time with that person outside of group, talking to them about why this behavior doesn't work or, or working out a cue between you and them uh, so that you can remind them when they're kind of stepping out of line and they can rein it back in again. You've got your exercises here, the rounds, the dyads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, taking time out. So it would be really good of you to think about this list and how many of these things do you have in your arsenal now and how many can you use going forward uh, so that you have as many options to maintain a safe group as possible short of tossing someone out of a group or terminating them from the group uh, altogether. And then last but not least, um, Timing. Timing is really, really, really difficult. For me, it's one of the most difficult group skills. And no matter how many times you do the same group, the timing is going to work out differently. The number of people that you have, the type of people that you have, when, what time of day the group is, there's all sorts of different things going on um, that are very uh, difficult to deal with. So the, the easiest way to think about timing is the rule of thirds. So the average group that, that I've been familiar with is 45 minutes long. So 15, 15, 15. So if 15 is setting the table, the introduction and the orientation, but by that 15th, 16th minute, you should be into the activity. Here's what we're doing today. Got to be preferably before the 15 minute mark, but 15 minute mark latest. And then when you get to that, um, the last 15 minutes of the group, you know, the 30 to the 45, if the group ends at 45, by now, we should be processing whatever exercise was done and doing the summary. So the rule of thirds is a basic rule of thumb, but it, it would, I would stretch the middle part out to more. So it would almost be like a rule of quarters, where first quarter introduction, last quarter summary, and that half is where the work happens uh, in between. Not too different from the summary of the whole group series uh, in a row. So a couple closing points. Watch your colleagues. The best way to learn is see the people that are senior to you, watch what works and watch what doesn't. Or have them sit in with you and you can see what they do. Uh, sometimes it's just stylistic. It's not a matter of what's better, you know, this person's smarter than me or better than me and more experienced. They just might have a different way about them. Uh, and we can use some of what they do uh, to help them. For example, one of my colleagues that I do presentations with, he has a very casual, relaxed approach to group. And what he says is, I pretend that I'm hosting a, a, a night talk show. So it just has this very informal you know, discussion. And I, I think that really works. And I've tried to steal that. Get involved with a group of your own. You will see what works and what doesn't. And you'll get to work on some of your own stuff. Some of your own stuff, right? Because that's going to come into group. Um, don't be afraid to ask the clients. What worked about group? What didn't work? That last session is a great time to ask about that. Or at the end of session, how did you like this? Could I have done this differently? Don't be afraid to get feedback. It makes you stronger. It makes you better. The other thing to remember is there is no perfect. I, I can't even think about how many groups I've led at this point. None were perfect, not one. I just keep trying to do better, keep trying to drop what doesn't work, and keep trying to pick up new tricks. And each, I find it gets better over time. And then what happens is I can relax and enjoy it more, and I find they're more productive that way anyway. You know, I also bring my stress into the group and bring that to the members as well. So just in terms of, of summary, um, group is comprised largely of, of the content and then the group dynamics. The content is the stuff you bring. The dynamics is that whole interpersonal piece. 
groups go through the different stages and we talked about the different types of stages. There's primarily a beginning, working, and ending stage, but there's variations on that. Each stage has its own characteristics and tasks, whether it's initiating and people forming their relationships in the beginning, doing the work in the middle after some fighting, and then closing off, consolidating gains and, and preparing to move on to the next stage in the closing. Focus is a key skill. Uh, how deep do you want to get in, in group as opposed to broad, getting more time with everybody? Cutting off and drawing out are essential skills. It's, it's like the gas pedal and the brake of a car. You don't want to be in a car that doesn't have a gas pedal and you sure don't want to be in one that doesn't have a brake. You don't want to be that way with a group either. Rounds, dyads, triads, and exercises spice up what happens in the group. So it's not reading, not a bunch of people talking to each other. It doesn't look like therapy. It's more active. You have the energy of all these other people in the room. Use it. Learning to be a good group facilitator is an involving process. Uh, it never ends. And that's the good thing. It means there's always capacity for improvement. You have many tools at your disposal. The list that was on that toolbox a couple slides ago, I'm sure there's much more than that. Those are just the ones I've found over 30 years. Timing is difficult, but a critical skill, and that rule of thirds, 15, 15, and 15. And again, I would, I would grow the middle part of that and shrink, uh, especially the beginning of it. Uh, but I think the rule of thirds is a nice, easy way to start out. And you'll find your own um, style from there. The other piece of advice that I would strongly recommend is that you invest in some of these books, which I have no financial interest in. Um, Social Skills Training for Schizophrenia, the Act book, the second half of the book is all social skills groups, which you can use for people with schizophrenia or in many other settings as well. So you've got your group right there, all mapped out for you. You don't have to come up with it yourself. We'll talk about that book a lot more in video three. Theory and Practice of Group Counseling is great. It has some great videos along with it. The Jacobs book, which um, this video and the previous one are largely based on, uh, also a great book, a lot of good uh, materials, also good videos, uh, group videos as well. Uh, and then I also threw in some other ones here. Yalom is a classic. This one, this is one of the, the books that started the whole thing. And anybody who's been doing groups for a while has one of these. So that concludes uh, the second of these videos regarding group. Again, there's gonna be at least one more. Uh, and again, I hope uh, this video helped you and I hope to talk to you again soon. Take care.